Tensions between Israel and Hamas is not slowing down. Palestine, it's such a mess right now that 400 people got killed in a hospital where one side is saying Israel did it, the other is saying Hamas did it. President Biden had to go to meet with Netanyahu and have a conversation. Even in a meeting, he says, well, with the recent events that happened, we're pretty confident that it was Hamas that did it, but we're looking into it. It's that you didn't do it. Like, that's what Joe Biden said to Netanyahu in his face, which was kind of interesting. And then to the point, 2.2 million people were talking about the Gaza Strip, one of the most densely populated places in the world. 75,000 people live within a square mile. No food, no water, no electricity, no hospital supplies. Since the night, they've had none of that. They're being pushed down. Imagine the viruses, the sickness. All of this stuff is taking place. At the same time, Russia's now getting involved. Hezbollah's commenting. Iran's been involved. U.S. is sending 2,000 troops that are ready to go out. It's just an absolute mess. So here's what we wanted to do. A number came out, a report, if you're looking at the screen, showing only four in 10, 18 to 29 year olds have a negative view of Hamas. If you look at this chart, you'll notice that when you look at 18 to 29 year olds, 10% of them, 10, one out of 10, views them positively. Why do they view them positively? Hamas positively? Where do these 18 to 29 year olds spend the most time with? At universities. Are professors speaking positively about Hamas? Is this why so many billionaires are taking money that they're no longer putting in universities, publicly saying we're no longer supporting University of Pennsylvania or Harvard or Yale or many of these other places? What is this all about? Why are they feeling this way? So we wanted to make a video specifically to talk about the history of Hamas, Hezbollah, and ISIS, a little bit of Al-Qaeda, so you know how they got started, what their motives are, what their vision is, and are they a terrorist organization? Categorically, they are. Why are they a terrorist organization? I think we need to take a deep dive to learn about their histories. So if you get value out of this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. So let's get right into it. I want to start off by posing a question for you to be thinking about. When does a political party become a terrorist organization? When do freedom fighters, a lot of people are saying, I'm doing this for freedom. When do freedom fighters stop being heroes and become killers? Let's take a look at Hamas first. So what is Hamas? Hamas is a spinoff, the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. In the late 80s, the Islamist militant group Hamas took over the Gaza Strip after defeating its rival political party, Fatah in elections in 2006. Its rival party, Fatah, which dominates the Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO, and rules in the West Bank, has renounced violence. So again, just to isolate these two here, Hamas, pro-violence, Fatah, we're not violence. Okay, we have a different way of going about presenting our argument to others, okay? So Hamas's founder was Sheikh Ahmed Yassin, a Palestinian cleric who became an activist in local branches of the Muslim Brotherhood after dedicating his early life to Islamic scholarship in Cairo. Yassin established Hamas as the Brotherhood's political arm in Gaza in December of 1987, following the outbreak of the first Intifada, a Palestinian uprising against Israeli occupation of the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. At the time, Hamas's purpose was to counter Palestinian Islamic Jihad, PIJ, another organization whose commitment to violence resisting Israel threatened to draw Palestinian support away from the Brotherhood. In 1988, Hamas established and published its charter calling for the destruction of Israel and the establishment of an Islamic society in historic Palestine, and they called it, we're going to bring back Sharia law to here. So that is their vision. We talked about this in a previous video as well. To continue, in what observers called an attempt to moderate its image, Hamas presented a new document in 2017 that accepted an interim Palestinian state along the Green Line border established before the six-day war, but that still refused to recognize Israel. Hamas first employed suicide bombing in April of 1993, five months before PLO leader Yasser Arafat and Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin signed the Oslo Accord. Then, finally, the U.S. in 1997 and the European Union designated Hamas a terrorist organization because of its armed resistance against Israel, which has included suicide bombing and rocket attacks. So this category for Hamas happened in 97. Today, Iran is one of Hamas's biggest benefactors, contributing funds, weapons, and training. Iran currently provides some $100 million annually to Hamas, PIJ, and other Palestinian groups designated as terrorist organization by the U.S. Hamas has fired rockets and mortars into Israel since the group took over the Gaza Strip in the mid-2000s. The group has also carried out incursions into Israeli territory, killing and kidnapping soldiers and civilians. Now, let's take a look at their violent history to see what they've done on the past before. Prior 
Prior to its 2023 conflict, Hamas and Israel had their deadliest fighting in 2021 when Hamas fired rockets into Israel following weeks of tensions between Palestinians and Israelis in Jerusalem. And during the 11-day conflict, Hamas and PIJ fired more than 4,000 rockets from Gaza, killing 10 Israeli civilians, injuring more than 300 others. And Hamas reportedly coordinated with the IRGC and Lebanon's Hezbollah, again, IRGC, Iran, Hezbollah, during the fighting and used so-called suicide drones along with its usual arsenal of less precise missiles, the United States and Egypt brokered a ceasefire to the conflict. So now let's talk about Hamas's hostages. In addition to Hamas's surprise attack on October 7th, Israel's military said at least 199 people had been taken hostage by Hamas. Officials from the U.S. and other countries are determining if their citizens are among the captives. You're hearing numbers around 250 people. And even recently, Hamas came out and said, listen, if they're figuring out a way to do ceasefire, they're talking to Israel, we will negotiate to give some of the children and women hostages up if you cease fire. They announced this, I think, on uh, Wednesday or Thursday, they made that announcement. So now we've talked about uh, Hamas. Let's not talk about Hezbollah and what Hezbollah's history is, because I have some history with Hezbollah. Because when I was in Iran, I remember what Hezbollah was doing to the streets, how many people feared Hezbollah. This is Hezbollah's history. Hezbollah means the party of God, is what they consider themselves. Hezbollah is a Shiite Muslim political party and militant group based in Lebanon, where it's extended extensive security apparatus, political organization, and social services network have fostered its reputation as a state within a state. So what is Hezbollah? They were founded in the chaos of 15-year Lebanese civil war, and Iran's back group is driven by its opposition to Israel and its resistance to Western influence in the Middle East, with its history carrying out global terrorist attacks. Part of Hezbollah, and in some cases the entire organization, have been designated as a terrorist group by the United States also in 1997 and by many countries. Now, when it comes down to their military strength, in the recent years, long-standing alliances with Iran and Syria have transformed Hezbollah into an increasingly effective military force, one that experts say would pose a challenge in the event of new fighting against its longtime enemy, Israel. Just to put this in perspective so you can look at it with numbers, Hamas is total roughly 40,000 soldiers is what Hamas has. Hezbollah is 150,000, nearly four times as powerful as Hamas. By the way, Israel is 400,000. So you may say, wow, Israel is massive. Not that much bigger than Hezbollah, if you think about it. 150 to 400, it is two and a half times, but it's not astronomically a bigger military organization. Hezbollah still has a lot of firepower behind their army that they have. Uh, let me continue with Lebanon's failing. At the same time, Hezbollah officials and other leaders in Lebanon are facing public discontent as the nation verges on failure and Hezbollah's political power could be shrinking. The history of Hezbollah's violence emerged during a Lebanon's 15-year civil war which broke out in 1975 when long simmering discontent over the large armed Palestinian presence in the country reached a boiling point. They were a group of Shiites influenced by the theocratic government in Iran, the region's major Shiite government, which came to power in 1979. This is when I was born in 78. Khomeini comes in around late January, early uh, February, Hezbollah's take over Iran, and it's a complete different country, complete different revolution, complete different way of living when that took place. And obviously when this happened in 1979, Hezbollah's took arms against the Israeli occupation. So many times when you hear Hezbollah, you'll hear Iran, Iran's funding, Iran, IRGC, you'll keep hearing these phrases. What does that really mean? Seeing an opportunity to expand its influence in Arab states, Iran and its IRGC, which stands for Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, provided funds and training to the budding militia, which adopted the name Hezbollah, meaning the party of God. It earned a reputation for extremist militancy due to its frequent clashes with rival Shiite militias, such as attacks on foreign targets, including the 1983 suicide bombing of barracks housing U.S. and French troops in Beirut, in which more than 300 people died. They were behind it. Hezbollah became a vile asset to Iran, bridging Shiites' Arab-Persian divides as Tehran established proxies throughout the Middle East. Remember how earlier we talked about Hamas's charter, what they stand for? This is Hezbollah's manifesto. Let me read it to you. In 1985 manifesto, they vowed to expel Western powers from Lebanon, called for the destruction of the Israeli state, and pledge allegiance to Iran's supreme leader. It also advocated an Iran-inspired Islamist regime, regime, but emphasized that the Lebanese people should have the freedom of self-determination. So again, Hamas, the enemy, Western civilization, Israel, 
Same exact thing with the manifesto that Hezbollah has. They're very much aligned on who the enemy is. The enemy of an enemy is a friend. You know that whole thing? This is when they're kind of like saying, you hate those guys and those guys? We do too. Let's become friends. That's where they're at. So aside from the manifesto, the group reiterated its commitment to its destruction of the Israeli state in its 2009 manifesto. 24 years later, Manifesto, same thing. The enemy is still Israel. Hezbollah has been blamed for attacks on Jewish and Israeli targets abroad, including the 1994 car bombings of a Jewish community center in Argentina, which killed 85 people and the bombings of the Israeli embassy in London. So, so you know, some people say, well, maybe if Israel, you know, withdraws and they leave, the tensions will go down. Even after Israel officially withdrew from southern Lebanon in 2000, it continued to clash with Hezbollah. That conflict didn't stop. Periodic conflict between Hezbollah and Israeli forces established in a month-long war in 2006, during which Hezbollah launched thousands of rockets into Israeli territory. And in August 2021, Hezbollah fired more than a dozen rockets in response to Israel's airstrikes in Lebanon. It was the first time the group claimed responsibility for rockets fired into Israel since 2006, Israel-Hezbollah war. Analyst and Brigadier General retired Asaf Orion of the Israeli Institute for National Security Studies says Hezbollah possesses a larger arsenal of artillery than most nations enjoy. And a 2018 report from the Center for Strategic and International Studies called it the world's most heavily armed non-state actor, Hezbollah. Meanwhile, critics say Hezbollah's existence violates UN Security Council Resolution 1559, adopted in 2004, which called for all Lebanese militias to disband and disarm. And in October of 2019, Hezbollah became a target of mass protests, government mismanagement, and years of slow growth had saddled Lebanon with one of the world's highest public debt burdens at 150% of its gross domestic product. So obviously a lot of people are sitting there saying, well, look, if, if Hamas is doing what they're doing, if Israel attacks a little too much, Hezbollah is going to get involved to back them up. And did we see a sign of that? That's exactly what happened. Following the October assault on Israel by Hamas, Hezbollah had fired shells across the Israel-Lebanon border in a show of what the group's leaders call solidarity with Hamas. It's like a announcement. Hey, just so everybody knows, we have their back. Hamas. And several Hezbollah's militias reportedly attempted to infiltrate Israel. Iran and Hezbollah likely advised and trained Hamas on how to attack Israel. Experts say the Hamas maintains that neither was involved in planning its 2023 operations. This has been written about all over the place. Wall Street Journal that Iran was involved in this attack that Hamas had on Israel. So, so far we've talked about Hamas and we've talked about Hezbollah. How about ISIS? And, and or how big are they today? Are they still as powerful as they were before? Let's talk about the history of ISIS. ISIS is a Salafi jihadist group that has conducted and inspired terrorist attacks worldwide, resulting in thousands killed or injured. In 2004, an Iraqi extremist network led by Abu Musab al-Zarqawi merged with al-Qaeda to form ISIS's predecessor group called al-Qaeda in Iraq. So in 2013, al-Qaeda in Iraq changed its name to ISIS, and in 2014, the group separated from al-Qaeda, declared itself a caliphate, and took over vast swaths of territory in Iraq and Syria. So if you're asking the question, I don't know what a caliphate is, here's the definition definition of caliphate. It's a political religious state comprising the Muslim community and the lands and peoples under its dominion in the centuries following the death of Prophet Muhammad. Now in 2019, an international coalition ejected ISIS from its last stronghold in Syria, although the group continues to operate clandestinely there and in Iraq. Despite losing many of its leaders in its territory, ISIS remains capable of conducting insurgent operations in Iraq and Syria while overseeing at least 19 branches and networks in Africa, Asia, and Europe. And by the way, when you look at size, tier one terrorist organization, some would say is Hezbollah, 150,000 of them, right? Tier two is Hamas. Tier three, when you look at ISIS, it's only roughly between eight to 16,000. And their operating areas is primarily in northern and eastern Syria and northern Iraq. Now, ISIS tactics and targets, ISIS uses targeted killings, IED attacks, ambushes, military-style assaults, kidnapping, and suicide attacks in Iraq and Syria. The group also encourages adherents worldwide to conduct operations in their own countries. And ISIS mostly attacks military targets and civilian defense forces, government personnel, infrastructure, in addition to foreign aid workers and civilians who ISIS perceives are working against it or are opposed to the interpretation of Islamic law. So if now you're wondering, you're saying, well, Hezbollah got a terrorist group designation. So did Hamas. Did ISIS ever get that? They did. In 2004, the U.S. State Department designated Al-Qaeda, ISIS's predecessor, as a foreign terrorist organization in December of 2004, a designation that remains in effect for ISIS till today.
So even though this is in 2004 and it still stands till today, you may be asking, well, when's the last time they even did an attack? Wasn't that like pre-Trump? Did we have anything that happened? Because during Trump, everybody forgot about ISIS. ISIS was very big during Obama. But I want to give you four of the different attacks they had recently. One of them is July 3rd of 2016, they attacked Baghdad, Iraq. They carried out a suicide car bombing that killed more than 200 people. January 16, 2019 in Syria, they conducted a suicide bombing outside of a restaurant killing 15 people, including four Americans. July 19, 2020. 2021, Baghdad, Iraq, they conducted a suicide bombing in a crowded market on the eve of Eid al-Adha holiday, killing at least 35 people and injuring more than 60. And last but not least, January of last year, 2022, in Syria, ISIS attacks Gawarian prison, leading to a week-long siege on the facility and surrounding neighborhoods, killing more than 100 prison guards and 400 ISIS detainees. So, so if you look at this chart, you'll notice a trend. Two of them are Iraq, two of them are Syria, three of them are suicide bombing. So again, going back to what their style is, suicide bombing, Iraq, Syria. To, to finish up the topic here on ISIS and comparing Al-Qaeda, I want to give you a little bit more context before we move on. Al-Qaeda and its affiliate remain a threat to the U.S. homeland while the Islamic State danger is more to the stability of the Middle East and U.S. interests overseas. Much of their rivalry between the two, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, involves a competition for affiliates with both trying to spread their model in Al-Qaeda's case to ensure its operational relevance. For now, the Islamic State focus is primarily on Iraq and Syria and to a lesser degree on the states in the Muslim world, particularly in Libya. Now, in the United States and in Europe, it may inspire lone wolves, but it's not directing its resources to attack in these areas and security services are prepared for the threat. Al-Qaeda is weaker and less dynamic than the Islamic State, but the former remains more focused on attacking the United States and its Western allies. So there not targeting Syria and Iraq, they're targeting U.S. So, so now somebody may be watching this and, and let's just say you're a Palestinian. Let's say you're Muslim. You're watching it's like, oh my God, what's this all about? How dare you put this? How about all the things that Americans have done? You know, how, how about the fact that you guys had a drone strike in August of 2021 and you were targeting somebody, but you missed your target, but you killed 10 innocent people. What about that, huh? U.S. has done that. And it's happened under every president. Biden, we had collateral damage under Trump, and we had collateral damage under uh, Obama, was trying to target this, and all of a sudden they target, they missed the opportunity. Totally get it. There, there's blood on many different countries' hands, including U.S.'s. But there's a difference. And you have to be reasonable enough to ask this question. When's the last time you heard Americans doing suicide bombing? When? Now, Americans believe in God. We also believe in God. I believe in God. But when's the last time you hear things like that? There is a reason why these guys get categorically, they get designated as a terrorist organization because they're willing to give up their lives to kill people that they think is the enemy. You can sit there and say, Pat, you're out of line. How about the time America? No problem. Not sitting here telling you everybody is, uh, you know, everyone's guilty and we're innocent and all this stuff. But you have to be able to reason and say, yeah, it's kind of a good point, man. They don't really have that reputation for doing that. Maybe folks from these three places do, but Americans do not. All right, so let's talk about update on Israel-Palestine. The, the last week here, I've been asking two questions. Number one, how did Israel not know that Hamas was going to attack and they're setting up a facility to learn how to come and get hostages? How does Israel not know? You brag about having the best intelligence in the world, Mossad, and you mean to tell me you missed this one? A little bit weird. Valid question. Then the other one that I asked earlier, and we've been talking about this on podcast with Vinny, Adam, and, and, and Tom, is if Palestinians are so great and they're so innocent, and they're such fantastic, peaceful people, why isn't Egypt willing to take them? They're their neighbors. They know them better than anybody else. Both questions gets a group to say, that's the right question to ask. Terrible question. Or they say, that's the wrong question. How dare you say that about Palestine? Because they know if they leave Palestine, Israel's going to take over Gaza. Really? Yes? Okay, fine. You give that argument. But my question isn't about if they leave. My question is, a lot of people are trying to leave. Why is Egypt saying, no, you can't come here? What's Egypt's incentive of keeping people there? So people say, well, no, that, that report of Egypt reporting and giving it to Israel is not true. Let me show you what we got here. September 20th, an intelligence report warned of the possibility that Hamas would launch rocket strikes into 
Israel, over the course of multiple days, the New York Times reported, citing U.S. officials. Then the second report from the CIA uh, dated October 5th, two days before Hamas carried out its attack, warned of an increased probability of violence from Hamas. This is twice. One September 28th, one October 5th, from CIA, is what Tom, where this is not like its hypothetical New York Post article. Then, a source familiar with the intelligence told CNN, the military friction in the Israel-Gaza region is nothing out of the normal, while another official familiar with the reports described them to be tying as routine. And meanwhile, Iran is sitting there saying, you know what, you guys crossed the line. We have to now intervene. And what does that really mean? Well, are the Hezbollah's going to get involved. They're going to get involved. They're, they got many different ways to get involved. And remember, tier three, ISIS, eight to 16,000. Hamas, 40,000. Hezbollah, 150,000. What happens if they get involved? It's a whole different story if they choose to get involved. Now, I want to put this thought for you to be thinking about when it comes down to the hospital with 400 people that got killed in the hospital. Whose fault is it? Israel? Is it Hamas? When I was living in Iran, during the time when, it's so funny, my dad's telling my wife today on what time I was born. I was born a little bit after midnight on October 18th. My mom's water broke. My dad's taking her to the hospital. There's curfew. They're past curfew. They get held up with semi-automatic weapons saying, what are you doing driving a car when the streets are empty? He says, my wife's water broke. She's break pregnant. They escort me to the hospital. And then I'm born a little bit past midnight on the 18th. Watch the story. An event happens in Iran called Cinema Rex Fire. Cinema Rex Fire. Cinema. Cinema. Rex. Name. Fire. Cinema Rex was in a city called Abadan. Abadan is the where, a place where all these oil refineries are, okay? There's a police station right across the street from Cinema Rex. When this happens, Khomeini, Hezbollah, everybody said, this is the work of Savak. They shut down the entire movie theater. 400 people couldn't leave the movie theater. They caught the place on fire. Pregnant women, kids died. Imagine you're burning, you can't get out because they locked up the place. It's called the Cinema Rex fire. Okay, I'm sure you've seen the story. They're posting the article all over the page while I'm talking to you. Hezbollah and Khomeini convinced Iranians that Reza Shah Pahlavi did it with the help of Savak. Savak was his Mossad. So our CIA, they're Savak. They were trained by Mossad and CIA. Again, they're intelligent group, right? You know what ends up happening to everybody in Iran? How dare this cold-hearted billionaire king monarchy spend 25 quarter of a billion dollars putting the celebration of 2500 years of iran this guy's so rich and we're so poor and you kill 400 innocent people boom escalated 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 everybody said the king did it revolution millions of people in the streets it was the biggest revolution ever that took place coup d'etat with none of the major four components that you need for a revolution you know who won Khomeini won. The Shah had to get in a helicopter, escape, get in a plane and leave. Do you know what happened a couple months later, a year later? Reports came back that fire was never the Shah. It was somebody that was part of Khomeini's camp that did it. Guess what? It's too late. Revolution already happened. What's the moral of the story? I don't know if Israel's behind it or not. And I don't know if Hamas is behind it or not. All I know is whoever's behind it that did this intentionally, there's a strategy behind it to put the blame on the other person to increase emotions, possibly yours and mine, and say, how dare they did something like that to get what they want. Whatever that they want is, we don't know yet. It may take us 6, 12, 18, 24 months to really find out who was behind it. But don't jump to conclusion taking one side or the other because it favors your argument. Sit back a little bit and let's really see what happens. I like what Joe Biden said today when he's sitting across uh, Netanyahu. He says, our intelligence tells us Hamas was behind it, not you. Obviously, we'll find out. But our intelligence said Hamas is behind it. Look at the way he's giving the answers, leaving it out. But he's saying, we have your back, but we're going to find out. That's the right approach to take because we still don't know who was really behind what happened with this hospital. So, so look, we can do a whole different video on World War III here soon on how many times we got close to and how to prevent it. Prevent it. That's going to come up here soon. But I want to give you a final thoughts to be thinking about. One of the biggest challenges you and I have as human beings because we're emotional beings. Robots don't have this challenge. You and I do. We have something called emotions. We have something called life experiences. We have something called beliefs, religion, who you believe in, what you believe in, political, all this stuff that we have, right? And our loyalty typically is to our parents, our heritage, our background. These guys can never do anything wrong. As a parent, I've been in the office where my kids were at fault and I'm sitting there saying, you pay the price. What is his, uh, you know, the price? He's going to be suspended. Totally get it. You pay the price. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a conversation. And then if I think it's too much, I'll have the private conversation with the principal. But if I think it's right, it's right. And there's been times where I've been in a 
place where I've watched the punishments went way too much and I've said, I don't think I'm good with this punishment. Did you guys look at the tape? So we have to be fair. There's some parents that are like, no, my kids are never wrong. He's an angel. And it's a lie because when I was a kid, there were many times I was wrong. Okay. And I know I was wrong as a kid, just like yourself. What's the moral of the story? Let's do our best to not join the jump to conclusion community just because it validates your argument or my argument. We're all guilty every once in a while. Now, sitting here telling you I'm an angel or you're an angel. All I'm saying during times like this where emotions goes from zero to let's, you know, go to war and do this. Let's kind of pump the brakes and let's not jump to conclusion. The only suggestion I got for everybody, the goal is to prevent people from dying. That's the goal. The goal is for people to live their lives. And the goal is to hold people accountable who are doing things that is not appropriate. And they're taking people's lives. But before we jump to conclusion, let's see who's behind it. Let's do some research. And then once we know, and if you're right, salute to you. If you're wrong, hey, I was wrong. Totally okay. I'm okay being wrong, and I'm okay being right. I'm more interested in finding out the truth, not being right or wrong. That's my job. Anyways, hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight. Having said that, we did a video. As a Middle Eastern myself, I wanted to find out who were the angriest people in the world. And I don't know if you've ever seen the study or not. As an Armenian, we were ranked third. I'm like, wow, now that's all starting to make sense. And as an Assyrian, Armenian from Iran, when you see the ranking, you'll see why. But it tells you a little bit about the history, why certain regions are angrier than others. If you've not seen this clip, click here to watch it. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye.